a five, six, seven, eight. When you hear the call, you've got to go. In my case, to be a dancing filmmaker in New York City. Yeah, anything is possible in the Big Apple. So welcome to my studio where I'd like you to meet some of my friends who are going for it as well. Living the dream can be challenging, but there's always time for magic. Our next guest is Chris Arbach. Chris is an actor, voiceover artist, singer, musician, and composer. He recently co-wrote and starred in a series of shorts called Stakeout. What fucking difference does it make? It makes, it's a big difference. I mean, the Atlantic stuff is poison. Pure fucking poison because the Atlantic's so dirty. I mean, the Alaskan stuff is cleaner because the Pacific isn't as contaminated yet. The Atlantic stuff, I mean, it's got so much mercury, you can get this th thing called uh, Minamata syndrome. A, min a min of what? Min now, you, now you're just making shit up. No. No, you're just min making no, shit no, up. No, I'm not. Minimata. Why exactly no, no, is I read the Atlantic about it. dirty? Because it's in the East Coast? No, no. Is no. the Pacific cleaner? They take yoga and the fucking. It has nothing to do with deep that. breathing it has and nothing shit to like do. that. It has to do, oh, has bean to do sprouts, with industrial so waste. So much fucking shipping lanes, fucking sewage. It's got a lot to do with the population, a lot of things. So, welcome, Chris Arbach. Oh, thank you. I'm so glad you came to the show. Great to see you. You were born and raised in New York City. That's absolutely right. That's absolutely Which borough? In Manhattan in Chelsea. Still, it was a very cool place to grow up because there were so many different kinds of people, which is always the best, I think, the best way to grow up. So, wonderful. Yeah. And you were born into acting royalty. Your father, Jerry Orbach, of course, played uh, Briscoe, Detective Briscoe on uh, Lord Order. Sure. And that was also your first acting role, right? Didn't well, you, that was one did of the, you do something before then? Well, that was, a, that, was the, that was the first union job I ever did, ah. yeah, which was very important. To, you played his nephew, I played his, his I played nephew. his nephew, yeah, yeah. How was that? Did you interact with your father on the show? Or only once. A different scene? Only once, very briefly. Uh, and... Uh, Honestly, it was it was an interesting time because I don't think I was ready for it at the time, and I was just very kind of overwhelmed. But uh, ready for being on camera acting, or facing your father on camera? <laughs> well, to both, you know. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I mean, I think uh, uh, the on camera part was uh, was a little easier. And you've been a musician your whole life, it seems. Yeah. You, you just played from a young childhood on. Did you grow up with a lot of music in the house? Oh, yeah. Well, we were... well my father, you know, he was in musicals. Yes. Through him, uh, I got into a lot of the classic singers like, uh, like uh, you know, like Frank Sinatra and uh, yeah. Louis Armstrong and stuff. But also, he was also very into folk music. He was also very, in, very into Bob Dylan. And I've always been sort of pulled between acting and music. And the result has always been that both have kind of suffered. Uh, because I get very into one and then I stop doing the other. Because I think it's a very American, very sort of market mentality which mm -hmm. is like, this is what you get paid for, this is what you're known for, so that's all you should do. And I think right. I've internalized that, and it's like limited me. So I'm yeah. tr really trying to break out of that. But by the same token, you know, uh, as you know, uh, show business is extremely tough. Uh, to get any traction at all is really tough. And in the past two years, acting has just felt warmer, Mm -hmm. It's felt like it's uh, easier to do than ever before because I've grown up a little. Yeah, and, you know yourself more. And also, uh, it just the response seems to be more positive, and that's hard to ignore. You know, it's very like, cool. So I have in my hand. Yes. Chris's uh, new album. You have two albums out. Yes, right? that's this the is most. This session. It's the most recent one. Yeah. And the cool thing is, I don't know. Can you see it? This is uh, from Austria. Yeah, on the inside. It's the it's, Secession Building from yeah. Vienna. 
Obviously, the word secession is a pretty strong word politically. It's separation. Yeah. yeah, and you hear it now that Obama's in office. A lot of people in mm. Texas want to secede from the country. Well, back when Bush was in office, a lot of New Yorkers <laughs> like me wanted to secede from the yes. country. Uh, you know, <laughs> I and remember. The word, I think, for me was more about uh, an artistic thing, which is what that, that movement in Vienna was all about, was that they seceded from the academy, the ah. Viennese Art Academy, because they thought it was too rigid. And that, and that we need to go our own way. And I thought that I needed to do that both as a musician and also personally, too, because there was a, you know, a lot of mixed feelings around losing my father and things that happened after that. There was this theme of, like, mm. I need to break away and start something new. So um, that's how that came about. Wow. We just did a play called Charlie Victor Romeo. Yeah. yeah. And uh, it's based on cockpit voice recorders. Uh, about impending airplane disasters. Yes, yes. They were examining reality TV back in the late 1990s and how, like, what that means for the culture. And it was reality, everything. And they were in a bookstore, and one of them said, oh, look at this, this transcripts from air disasters. Mm. And one guy looked at it and says, you know, that kind of looks like a script. And they got the idea, why don't we stage this? People found it very intense and very Mind moving, blowing. very very tough to take so in So you were places. saying the lines of a person who was about to die or crash or... In many cases, uh, yeah. Emergency not, landing or something. Yeah. What I was fascinated by was the fact that these people were so well-trained and so professional. Mm. And, and when you become a commercial airline pilot, you, you get years and years of training before you are allowed to do that. And what I noticed was that for these guys, they put all the emotion into the training because I think if they mm. thought, like if they broke down and said, oh God, I'll never see my wife again, then they definitely gonna crash. But to them, they're not crashing the plane, they're trying to land the plane. So right to the end, they're following procedure, they're, try they're trying to solve the problem. Yes. And that's really what was the most moving and heroic part for me was that right to the last second, they were trying everything they could. But just the fact that they never gave up Wow. was very, very moving, yeah. yeah. And very cool to do as an actor. It was a fun, oh, I bet. fun project. It had wonderful reviews. Oh, yeah, okay. for sure. Now, I found a little quote here uh -huh. on Facebook. <laughs> oh, cool. You describe yourself as a walking contradiction, a condo-living anarchist, a Rolex socialist, an Audi-driving singer-songwriter, an anti-consumerist who works on ad campaigns, uh -huh. a twisted romantic, a smart guy with shitty grades. <laughs> it's, a great, it's a great description. But it, it pretty much sums it up. <laughs> like you said, it is a contradiction. And, you know, we're trapped in this market economy and there's temptation all around us to want nice things. And that's very human, too. It's, it's both sides of human nature. It's very human to want the best for yourself. And you could stay in that head. I think it's also human nature to want to try to want the best for everybody. Um, and I don't think anybody can live in one side or the other all the time, but I think most of us who are sort of hyper aware, we're trying, you know, and we're at least <laughs> looking at it, you know, and it's like, how much can you really enjoy a $2,000 or $10,000 suit if you're walking over somebody who's starving, you know, and, and that's, I think that's a question that everybody has to sort out in modern life, and some people look at it and some people don't. What's your favorite German word? Oh, uh, <laughs> jawohl. <laughs> That's a good one. Because it's affirmative and very strict, <laughs> and yet positive. This is a strict, yeah, exactly, so I, so I, I like it. Yeah. Uh, my greatest weakness is? My greatest weakness, uh, uh, ooh, second guessing myself. <laughs> <laughs> Good one. <laughs> I would love to meet. Oh, gosh, if it could be anybody, it would be John Lennon. Ah, yeah, for sure. Very cool. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm really good at? I'm told I'm really good at giving hugs. Ah, yeah, I'm nice. a good hugger. Yeah, I love it. I think so. Now, if you had the power to change anything in the world, uh, what would you change? Oh, my goodness. Oh, the environment threats to the environment, if there was a, if, if I could find a way to, to feed and power everybody in as least cruel ways and least destructive ways as possible, if I could change that, I would, right, like right now. Excellent. Yeah. 
Thanks so much for coming. Thank you. Here, I'm getting a hug. Oh, yeah. <laughs>